Thank you very much. It's a great uh, privilege to be with you on such an occasion as this, and, uh, and thank you very much for, um, for listening to me. Um, I expect most bishops have stories of uh, speaking not to groups like this, but in primary schools where children ask you the most amazing questions. I remember once having explained what a bishop is and what a bishop does, and at the end of it, a little girl asked a question. She said, but do you have a proper job? <laughs> and I had, to ad I had to admit that I didn't. But uh, another bishop told me the story of uh, speaking in a school, and a little boy asked the question at the end, how did you become a bishop? And he realized that this was the vicar's son was asking this question, so he said, Jamie, why do you ask? And he said, because my dad says he has no idea how you became a bishop. <laughs> and, uh, in 15 minutes, you may be wondering the same thing about me. But what I'd like to do is to say something um, about what a local animal-friendly church congregation would look like because I guess most of you belong to a church congregation somewhere and hope to take a message back from today uh, to encourage your church to be more animal-aware and animal-friendly. A few years ago, the Anglican Society for the Welfare of Animals decided to give awards to churches that are animal-friendly, and it's proved an interesting exercise. And I want to suggest that an animal-friendly church congregation is one that firstly takes some practical steps to being animal friendly. Secondly is one that has a pastoral heart, um, and I'll expand on that. And thirdly, one that is evangelistic and outward looking and wants to grow. And so in the 15 minutes, I hope to say perhaps about five, take about five minutes talking about practical steps, five minutes talking about the pastoral consequences, and five minutes looking at the evangelistic opportunities that arise. Firstly, practical steps can be quite straightforward, and I'd just like to illustrate it with a personal experience. A few years ago, when I was still Bishop of Monmouth, I was leading a pilgrimage walk through my diocese along the English-Welsh border, meeting um, the Diocese of St. Asaph walking in the opposite direction. And some of my people came for all five days of the walk, and some just joined in for a day, and they all seemed to be bringing dogs. And uh, some of them got the dogs sponsored to raise money, and the dogs raised a lot more money than the human beings. Um, but I remember we arrived at one village, and I can't now even remember the name of it. We spotted the parish church. The sun was shining. It had a beautiful-looking churchyard, so we decided to stop and have our sandwiches there. And I noticed that outside the church door was a dog bowl with clean water, and the church, thankfully, was open. But what we found inside really amazed us. There was a kettle, paper cups, water, tea, coffee, biscuits, and dog biscuits, and a notice that said something like, thank you for visiting our church, because all visitors are a blessing to us. You and your dogs are most welcome. Please help yourself to refreshments, which we're pleased to provide with our love and prayers. Well, we, the, the pilgrims and the dogs, helped ourselves, and then panic set in. And I discovered what really drives Anglicans mad, and that is when they want to give money and can find no way of doing it. <laughs> and they went round searching for begging bowls, for money safes in the walls, or for a money chest, some devised wonderful ideas of putting five-pound notes in hymn books that people would find on a Sunday. Um, and they could not get the message that the people there wanted us and our dogs. They didn't want our money. And they thought that really was very strange. And some of them were so traumatized that I thought they were going to need therapy. <laughs> but it had a profound impact on them because they all agreed but although they'd not met a single member of the congregation, that was the kind of church they would love to worship in. And so they got that message. And I did suggest to some of them that they might learn from that experience. And a dog bowl outside a church gives a positive message of welcome and of a congregation that has a concern for all God's creatures. 
recently I went to uh, Malvern. Now in Malvern you get a really nice class of Christian. And uh, I can't remember whether it's a priory church or an abbey church, but it's a, a vast building. And in the porch there was a notice that said, dogs accompanied by well-behaved owners are welcome. <laughs> and there was a, a dog bowl with fresh water. Many churches, I think, are also aware of the need to make their churchyards places that reflect their care of the natural world. And areas are deliberately set aside as meadow to encourage bitter butterflies and insects and voles and mice and all sorts of other animals. Some place nesting boxes on the trees and insects and bat hotels to encourage wildlife. One churchyard I know where so happens that the church, one of the church wardens is a professor of botany, um, but they have um, an area in the center that's been left as meadow, a center around the walls that's been left as meadow, and little runs uh, so that animals don't have to go th across the mown areas where they might be vulnerable to predators. And a good churchyard will also have notices that explain the church's policy of encouraging wildlife and pictures of what animals people might expect to find there and seats where they can sit and enjoy the environment. So those, I think, are some of the examples of practical things that people can do to establish an animal-friendly church. And then there are the pastoral considerations. And it's interesting that the word pastoral, of course, finds its roots in the animal world. It's about the shepherd caring for his or her sheep. And our churches exist as places of worship, but also as places of pastoral care. And I want to suggest two ways of doing that. The first is to allow and even encourage people to bring their dogs to church. You know, for many dogs, church is a dirty word. When the owners turn and say, we're going to church, that means you're staying at home. You're not coming with me. And, uh, and yet for many, their dog is their best friend and a full-time companion, and they feel some sort of sense of betrayal in leaving them at home to go to church. Um, it so happens that I had to, um, there was no one at home at the moment, and uh, I had to take my dog to some kennels yesterday, and it felt somewhat ironical that I was putting my dog in kennels so I could go and talk on animal welfare. Um, but she'll forgive me once she sees me. Um, and many years ago, I was the vicar of Brighton and became involved in the local protests at Shoreham against live animal exports. And the protesters were described as the Blue Rinse Brigade, because they were not extreme animal rights protesters, although a few did turn up and sadly got a lot of media attention, but most of the protesters were respectable middle-class animal lovers who were outraged at seeing these animals being transported in such conditions, only to be taken to France so they could be slaughtered and described as French sheep or whatever. Um, and I discovered that uh, when I went on and joined the protest line, that many of the protesters thought that the church had no interest in animals whatsoever. I got quite a bit of flack from that. And so I said, well, we will lay on a church, on a church service at Brighton Parish Church, and you will be welcome to bring your animals. And many did. And at that service, I said, if ever you want to bring your dog on a Sunday, you're very welcome to do so. And quite a number did. And of course, you need to be sensitive and recognize that some people may have allergies or phobias and perhaps have an area of the church where people uh, do not take animals. But actually simply giving that message can be uh, a very positive one. There's one country church in Wales. I shall be there tomorrow to celebrate the Eucharist at 11 o'clock. And people have to walk across a field in order to get there. And we always know who is coming five minutes before they arrive because their dogs arrive. The dogs come into church wagging their tails, uh, sharing the peace with everyone who happens to be present. And then they're followed by their owners. And somehow there's something that's quite natural and even spiritual and sacramental 
about having um, animals joining in worship, animal creation being there, apart from the usual death watch beetle. Um, somehow it reflects the prayer of the psalmists, uh, having that vision of all creation praising God. And one of the chief areas of pastoral concern for all churches is bereavement care. And I know many churches have trained bereavement visitors for those who have lost loved ones. But we don't often recognize that people are bereaved when they lose a companion animal, often a, a dog or a cat or sometimes even a budgie or a rabbit or something like that. Last year, a, a priest in a parish near where I live became aware that when visiting people in their homes, they, she often saw photographs of dogs and cats and other pets that they had but were not longer around. And so she would ask them who they were, what they were. And uh, she said they would often tell her that these were animals that they had that had died. And then she said they would sometimes cry or their tears would well up in their eyes. And so she decided to have a memorial service for all who had lost pets. And she encouraged them to bring along photographs to thank God for all that their animal companions had given them in life. And the service clearly met a need because she had a packed church. Many people turned up and were grateful for the opportunity to mourn their animals without feeling silly. And uh, in the last few minutes, if I can move towards the sort of evangelism, because I believe that being an animal-friendly church will evangelize the congregation and attract people to the faith. As I said, many people on those protest lines at Shoreham uh, just thought the church was only interested in saving human souls, that we weren't interested in the fact that God has redeemed the whole of creation. Um, and so... Um, somehow we need to, to get that message across. And one obvious way is to have animal blessing services around the Feast of St. Francis in October, and the Anglican Society for the Welfare of Animals produces special materials for Animal Welfare Sunday. And people who, often, who don't often go to church regularly will come to a blessing service with their companion animals. And I think I've blessed everything from a horse to a giant worm. Although I'm always suspicious, suspicious of small boys who come forward with a cardboard box with holes in it that might contain a snake or two. But animal blessing services provide an opportunity to give thanks for the animals we know and for whom we care. But it really is only the beginning of opening a door to getting people to recognize the other animal issues that we need to face. And so it always provides an opportunity to talk about animal issues and to talk, say something about animal cruelty and welfare and such issues as animal experimentation and intensive farming and hunting and all those other animal issues that we need to just to um, make people aware of. I often remind people that we make moral decisions almost every day when we shop. And as Christians, we have to ask if what we are buying is exploiting poor people or animals, or both. The demand for cheap meat cannot be met without animal exploitation, and choosing a veg vegetarian option or eating less meat or no meat during Lent is a way that Christians can lead by example. I was reading a book called uh, about being Christian disciples by my predecessor, Bishop of Monmouth, who was a chap called Rowan Williams. And he says that uh, Christians can make a difference in our world. And he cites three areas in which, uh, which come to mind immediately for him. He says one is slavery that it was Christians that made people aware that of the meta-narrative, the big picture in the Bible. The Bible doesn't actually condemn slavery. In fact, it says that you should be kind to your slaves. It doesn't actually say you shouldn't have slaves. But the meta-narrative, the big picture, is one of God wanting his people to be free, to be the people he created them to be. 
And so slavery is seen as being contrary to the will of God. Um, and uh, slavery is one of the issues uh, where Christians uh, were in the forefront of, of making change. Another, he says, is in the hospice movement. It was Christians who started the first hospices to say people can die well. People can die without being in pain. People can die with dignity. And dying is important. It's an important part of living. We shall all die. And to die well is what something that every Christian can hope for. But he said the third movement that immediately comes to mind is fair trade, of saying that we need to be aware of what we buy and whether what we are buying might be exploiting other people or animals. And animal blessing services therefore raise awareness of the place of animals in creation. Animals can survive without human beings, but human beings cannot survive without animals. And yet we rarely hear them mentioned in prayers on a Sunday morning. I know I used to collect the most dreadful prayers that I've heard as I went round as a bishop on a Sunday morning. O oh Lord, as thou hast doubtless read in this morning's Sunday Times. O oh Lord, thou knowest that we know that thou knowest, and uh, the ones that go on and on. And, um, and I once heard someone pray for those who are sick of this parish, to which... Um... But rarely do I hear people pray for animals. Um, even on Harvest Festival, I've heard people give thanks for the fruits of the harvest, praying for the farmers, farmers but no mention of animals. And yet we need to remember that God so loved the cosmos, so God so loved the world. The Greek word is cosmos. It's not God so loved human beings. It's God so loved the entire creation that he gave his only son. And if God so loved the world, then so should we. So thank you for listening.